And you know, in 1929, the world was a very different place. Uh, a woman had three choices, nursing, teaching, or secretary. Failing that, she got married. What, what girls had to get married and have children, and it wasn't really important for them to have too much education. Well, of course, I mean, women never even became persons until 1929. I'd like to know what we were supposed to be before 1929, because I don't think I felt any different afterwards. But, but um, uh, legally, you were not, you had no rights at all. This was not true in the family. If I stated that I wanted to do something, it would be encouraged. It was in the outside world where you would recognize that the doors weren't really open. first of April, so I'm an April Fool, 1911. My paternal grandmother was very anxious to have a male grandchild. So my father, being in a festive mood, told her that the baby had been born, was a healthy baby, and uh, it was a boy. So she rejoiced, and then he backtracked and they said, no, no, April Fool, it's a girl. And my grandmother was so mad at him that she, I don't think she spoke to him for months afterwards. So uh, I, I think this indicates the, the importance of the difference in the sexes. My brother was quite different from me. He was much more like my mother, a gentler sort of person. I remember the principal in the grade school saying to me that there wasn't a girl in the school that spent as much time in his office as I did, because I was always talking and, and gabbling, and I'm sure I was a nuisance. I always had a, a feeling for for the underdog or something. I don't know how you'd say it. I remember my mother said I would never pass a beggar on the street without asking for a penny for the beggar. I, I did want to make a difference, and I felt that I was capable of making a difference. And I remember my mother telling me once when I was a small child, June, you can't solve everybody's problems. <laughs> And uh, my two favorite books at my early teens were Ivanhoe and The Seats of the Mighty by Gilbert Parker. We were also memorizers in those days, and this was just part of the school. You know, how can man die better than facing fearful odds for the ashes of the fathers and the temples of their gods? There wasn't the consciousness that boys and girls have need to have a different kind of reading, I think. And so we read all the things that were written for boys. Except Anne of Green Gables. My grandmother gave me that for Easter when I was 11. And I immediately became a, a fan of Anne and understood her difficulties, you know, because she was a fiery spirit. And Anne certainly was always trying for some kind of uh, individuality. And in those days, families went to church. And almost everything, everything in the church was my brother's this and, and my brother's that. And um, I know people nowadays have identified sexist language. And some are very, some think that it's trivial. And yet, you can imagine a young girl 
you know, you're recognized as a mother and you're recognized as a potential mother, but you're not recognized as an individual yourself. But I realized that no matter what men said, God would understand my position and he would accept me. He, would, he knew that I counted. This uncle was almost like a father. I mean, we were all brought up together. And uh, he, <laughs> practically to his dying day, uh, whenever he introduced me, he would say, this is my favorite niece, Sybil. She's not pretty, but she's smart. What was implicit there was that it was important for a girl to be pretty. And in high school, unless you were the conventional pretty, pretty, nice, nice girl, I was a demanding personality. As I look back on it now, and without being uh, vain or boasting, I think my interests were beyond my years, and that was not the usual pattern, nor was it a comfortable way to be. So I didn't fit. I continued to school, like, you know, till about grade 10. And then I went to business college. And um, because of the depression, it was very hard to uh, get steady work. But because of that, there was uh, a business girls club that was set up. One of the first, uh, you know, enterprises or projects, you might say, uh, that was trying to help, you know, women trying to help women. I knew I wanted to go to university. And I wanted to study physics. I was the only woman in the physics class. And the teacher rather resented my presence. And he would turn his back to me and talk to this, it was a small class anyway, about eight or 10 people, talk to these boys and um, tell them dirty jokes. And you had to have that, that I think the core of self-confidence and self-respect, which I got through my family, in order to withstand that type of what I would call attack. The person's case that we were going to speak about came about because there was a, a senator who died and it was suggested that his term could be finished off, served out by his wife. It went to court and uh, there was a group of women in Alberta who took a very great interest in this and they took it to the Supreme Court of Canada. And the Supreme Court of Canada said no, a woman could not serve in the Senate because for the purposes of government and parliamentary procedure, a woman was not a person. And these women in, in Alberta were deeply exercised over this and uh, persisted uh, with their claim that women were persons and eventually took it to the Privy Council in Great Britain, which was still the court of last resort for Canada. To us it seemed so stupid that we had to go to the Supreme uh, Court and to, and to the uh, Privy Council in London to decide that we were human beings who had the same rights as our brothers and our cousins and our fathers. The Privy Council pondered and pondered and finally, in 1929, they brought down the decision that yes, a woman was a person. And it, for me personally, that has a very interesting connotation because that's the year I graduated from university. So there I was standing up there with the bearded archdeacon handing me my diploma. I didn't know I'd turned into a person. When um, we were on the verge of graduating, they had teams of people come to the university to interview graduate students, and they weren't interviewing women. There were really only three options for a girl with any kind of education. Uh, aside from being a housewife, uh, she could be a stenographer, she could be a teacher, she could be a nurse. And that was it. 
as long as I was earning some money, I guess I just didn't think too much about it. And um, I went to work um, as a waitress. Because I had been in the intelligence service during the war, I guess my record was there. And I was approached by the communications department in Ottawa. And uh, one of the questions that I answered was, do you intend to get married? And I knew that if I had answered yes, I wouldn't get the job. When I said I was going to get married, this was in 1931, and the president of the company calls you up to his office and talks to you about your affiliation with the, the firm and uh, your future. And in floweriest language, he wishes you all the happiness in the world. May you live long and be happy. And then, in effect, he fires you because if you were married, you couldn't work. President of the Manitoba Teachers Federation it was at that time. He just couldn't understand why women should have the same pay as men, why women shouldn't retire at 65, they had to retire at 60, not at 65, why, they, why their pensions were different from the pensions of men. Uh, why there were no women principals at the junior high school level. After, my, after Rebecca, our oldest daughter, was born in 1958, I left the labor market. And um, so I was out of the labor market, a full-time homemaker. And this is the time that I began to feel a loss of identity. And I can only say that if you're a woman and a thinking woman at the age I was, in the situation I was, society was all wrong for you. There was nothing for you to do. Uh, everywhere you looked, women were denigrated, and that word is not too strong. I was working harder than I had ever worked in my life, and doing what was probably the most important job that I would ever be doing. And yet, I was called a dependent, and my security in the present and in the future was totally dependent on the goodwill of my husband and his capacity as a wage earner and his generosity. And, um, and of course, this is wrong. I had, like I had five children, a social worker spoke to me and said, you know, if you stay home, and look after the children, then you can, you can collect mother's allowance. So they used to say every woman is only one man away from welfare, and there was such a difference between the way that men were paid and the way that women were not paid or that women were paid when they were in the labor market. There was just no way that a woman was going to make an independent, viable life for herself. You're torn two ways. You have children that are dependent on you and that need you to be there for nurturing and look, you know, and looking after them and giving them the support that all children should have. And at the same time being able to be away from the home long enough to make a, you know, a, a decent wage. And um, so you're caught between accepting um, what so many people look down on, people that have never had to be in that position. My husband died in 1965, and uh, I was left rudderless because I hadn't anything interesting enough to occupy me. And it was just by the sheer, well, I would say, that God's own mercy that I happened to meet June. And uh, 
she was already doing work for the women's movement. And because we were national and we had numerous local associations, we were all working and becoming aware of the same, the same um, omissions and discriminations at the same time. I was trying hard to get more women into administrative positions. So I uh, mentioned to uh, one of my colleagues uh, that uh, one woman on his staff was really eligible. She had taught with me and she was bright and she was innovative and I thought she would make an excellent principal. So I said to him, uh, why, why don't you recommend her for principalship? And he looked at me aghast and he said, oh no, no, she doesn't want to be a principal. I said, have you asked her? No, 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 no. Besides, what would I do without her? And this was so often the attitude. Uh, and we were, these are all button, buttons we were pushing. Women in politics, women in the labor force, women in, in the home. Why don't women have more say? Why aren't they listened to more? Because they have valid things to say. All of us, many of us, not all of us, but, <laughs> but a great many of us. The various organizations got together and presented a brief to Mr. Pearson, who was at that time the Prime Minister, saying that we wanted a royal commission on the status of women in Canada. And um, <laughs> I understand that, that uh, he called Judy LaMarche and said, how am I going to get these women out of my hair? <laughs> She said, do it. <laughs> First of all, of course, you have to remember the Royal Commission on the Status of Women came down. And that's where we really got to work. We decided that we would approach, for instance, all of the Crown Corporations, railways. Why were there not women working on the tracks? Why were there not women engineers? Uh, why were there not women doing all kinds of things? So we, we set up appointments with <laughs> the union bosses. <laughs> and the poor fellows were scared stiff. They didn't know what they were going to see. But they were glad to see just a bunch of middle-aged women. When it was suggested to me that I write Saturday's Stepchildren about women in Canadian business, uh, I was motivated not only by my cousin Ruth's experiences, she had trained two of her boss, three of her bosses, and was told by the head of the company that she wore the wrong kind of pants. They didn't talk about the glass ceiling at that time, but it was very evident and it was there. I remember when we went out to Red River Community College, I was sitting beside the man who was the head of the trades, and he said to me, you wouldn't recommend that a woman be a plumber. It's a very dirty job. And I said to him, have you ever changed diapers? And, and you know, I think, I think it, in, in a sense, it put men on the defensive or something. They had always, maybe I'm wrong, but I think that some men possibly um, felt that their territory was being invaded. When we were leaving, one of the, this fellows came to Agnes and he had his coat, one of these men from Red River, and he said, would she help him on with his coat? And she said, well, yes, of course, but why? He said, because you have given up all rights to my uh, courtly behavior towards you, it's your turn. And it was incredible. Perhaps the most important event that took place that permitted the rights of women to be understood by large numbers of people was the Irene Murdoch case. Irene Murdoch was an Alberta farm wife. She was abused in her marriage for one thing. She left her husband and she applied for her share of the farm property. It was her father's money that had helped buy the farm in the first place. In the summertime, her husband was off about his affairs like rodeos and so on, and she ran a, a, a dude ranch and gardens and looked after the farm. Uh, she did more than her share. And then when they bought another farm, her mother lent them some money so that she really had an inalienable right to the uh, product of whatever the farm produced. 
And when the judgment came down, the, the judgment said that Irene Murdoch was entitled to nothing because she did only what was expected of a farm wife. She was not entitled to her rights in the homestead because she had left her husband. Mind you, this is after she had had her arm broken and been physically abused. The effect of abuse, of living in an abusive situation and the children, it can be, a, a, you know, a life-threatening and in some cases. And I think that that is partially why I wanted so much to become involved in um, women's rights that they are have to have respect. We used to be told that the law, that him included her in the law. In fact, it didn't. As far as penalties were concerned, it included her. As far as benefits were concerned, it didn't include her. And we worked out this skit talking about the great wrong that was done to Irene Murdoch. And we called it, as I have said, the balloon lady, which was a catchy phrase. We had the picture of a woman with these several balloons, these are the rights that we thought we had. And as we discussed each one of them, we would puncture the balloon. These balloons should have supported her, but didn't. And this is how we pointed out that there were no laws to support women. We were asked to make this presentation in dozens of places. And I think we made it about 50, 50 times plus in Manitoba. We did it in Alberta. We did it in Saskatchewan. After the Irene Murdoch case, nobody ever said to me, what is it you women want anyway? They always used to say that earlier. What is it you women want? After Irene Murdoch, the Supreme Court had made it obvious what women wanted. And so that was, that was a, uh, the real beginning of the, of the move to change family law. What, what the future holds, I, what I would like it to hold is when we would stop, we, we, we wouldn't have a category for women's rights, that all rights would be human rights. And women being human beings would no longer require special attention to, to uh, receive the same rights as the rest of the population. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done now. There are things now that are coming out that we didn't have to deal with. We weren't dealing with sexual harassment. We weren't dealing with violence. And there are so many kinds of abuse. People think maybe of physical abuse as being the major factor, which in some cases it is. But there's also sexual abuse, there's harassment, um, there's, you know, emotional uh, abuse. And it's like, you know, that it's so, so devastating. It just destroys a woman altogether. That is why I became involved with um, Alpha House, a second stage housing for abused women and children. I think that um, the new younger women coming up seem not to be burdened with the, with the image of acceptability that we were burdened with. It took a fair amount of courage to stand up and say, look, this needs to be changed, and this is the reason why. And, and we had a, I think we had a good audience. I have a, a little story I'd like to tell you about my uh, granddaughter, who is in the, my husband, my son's firm, and it's her responsibility to oversee the shipping department. And she said to me, you know, Gran, I can't stand this fellow. He says to me, I was out last night, I had a lot of beer, and boy, did I meet a swell broad. And she said, it just makes me angry. And I said, well, Lynn, say to him, I'm glad you met a good-looking woman, but here you don't refer to her as a broad. You refer to her as a woman. And in my presence, don't do it. Oh, Gran, she said, it's hard. And I said, it may be hard, you have to do it. <laughs>